and in doing so, I'll look at some of the old slides with those exercises to get to begin. Okay. So yeah, I think um, <clears throat> the exercises were kind of very simple. They're not mandatory. And if you're joining me for the first time, if you weren't here for the first part, uh, the first part was going over the structures of consciousness as John Gebser articulated in Epicles and Origin and his other works. And really trying to engage with them in a phenomenal conscious way. Um, considering the experience of time and space, and how that experience has transformed over human history. Um, to the point where uh, we're at today, we're exploring what he was talking about with the integral consciousness or this new, or this new mutation or new emergence, uh, perhaps an intensification as we're going to see that word as well. Um, so yeah, as you see, here are the structures as we went over last week. And uh, these kind of move and unfold in a, in a kind of opening up of dimensionality from zero to a point or a circle to a the mental triangle then to the integral sphere, which implicates uh, diaphaneity or transparency. And so that's what we're really gonna dive into. The last one was kind of a, a few quick jumps from one structure to another, where really they each deserve their own class or semester to really kind of digest and integrate, no pun intended. Um, but we kind of jumped through all of them within about two hours. Uh, the integral, however, is gonna get its own session, so I'm very happy about that. And um, yeah, if you're just joining us, uh, welcome. We are gonna be recording the session if you miss anything and I will try to share the slides if I can upload them to Neura. Um, if you missed it, there is a Neura page, like a class portal that you can sign up for. Um, actually, you don't have to sign up. That's, it's free to access, I made sure of that. So you don't need to log in to anything. Um, I will share that link at the end of this class as well. So let's get started. Okay. So, uh, sorry, one second, there we go. So yeah, uh, two ways you can help uh, with this kind of class, which is a free class. And we are hoping to have as many of our classes free as we can. Of course, we can't do that quite yet, but at least some of them we can. And with classes like this, and kind of an obscure but fascinating topic, we try to have free. So uh, this is a two-parter, and I'm sure there's going to be interest in kind of going into deeper aspects of what Gepser is talking about. Perhaps we can do a Tehar de Chardin read, and so on. So those are the kind of classes we like to offer for free down the road. Uh, and the way you can do that, of course, is to support Nura directly through a donation. And you can go to neurolearning.com and donate there. There's uh, on the on the header, the nav bar, there is uh, an about area and support slash shop. It's basically you can buy a t-shirt or just give us a direct donation. Um, and then there's my Patreon, which I will also link to in the chat box in a minute. And that's another direct way of, of helping me uh, put out this content, mine and, and others, uh, for free or uh, an accessible price as much as possible as we go through this next year, 2018. And so welcome, we've made the temporal leap to the new year. Um, so I wanted to begin with a little review of what integrality meant or means and Gepser's definition of it. Um, and let's see here, I got a little note coming up. Sorry, one second, guys. Your fate, your, oh, your, my, my voice fades time to time. Let me see if I can make sure my microphone is working correctly. And if anybody else has that problem too, I could be just walking, moving away from the microphone a little too much. So sorry about that. Um, but yeah, if this comes up again, just let me know. <laughs> sorry about that. Okay. So here we go. So as we remember from the first session, transparency for Gepser, and we're going to go into Gepser a little bit more into his kind of biographical experiences of integrality. It means diaphaneity. It means transparency. And he also uses the terms ego freedom. So the self becomes transparent to these larger forces of consciousness at work through the self uh, as a kind of creative force of the self, what kind of brings the self into being. Uh, there's a transparency of an awareness of that kind of bringing the self into, into being. And there, there, this relates very much to some Buddhist concepts as we're going to go into a little bit later as well. 
Uh, another aspect of integrality is time freedom. Uh, he describes this as the achronon, or time, seeing a perceiving time as a whole, past, present, and future. And this kind of, kind of stuff sounds a little um, uh, far-fetched at first, but if you stick with it, you, you'll probably kind of feel into it a little bit more. Uh, but he also describes it as the realization of the spiritual origins. So without, again, the dissolution of the self, without submerging into complete ego death, uh, but not being codified or ossified or stuck in the ego as well. So there's a sense of the self, but the self becomes transparent. It's able to be, it's able to live and thrive and be a unique person. But with this kind of spiritual diaphaneity that kind of shines through the self and shines through the world. Again, very kind of a mystical understanding and intuition here. Um, he also describes time and again through every present origin is that this is neither the waking rational self or mind or the twilight irrational dreaming self, but a kind of lucidity that pervades and again shines through with this pristine clarity. So this is my way of putting it. We move from the cave to the sort of waking daylight plane to the clear winter sky of night or day. It doesn't matter. All things pass through it. Uh, and then he also kind of mentions this, which is another important thing, that the structure, the integrality, uh, to achieve it, we can't forfeit the other forms, the other structures of consciousness, the magic and the mythic, the mental, all of those things are important. We can't forfeit them in their efficient mode. So there's something about them that constitutes us and we can't avoid them or get rid of them or suppress them without some kind of consequences taking place as we started to explore in the first session. Um, and I mentioned this quote, which was uh, Gepser's winter poem, translated by Aaron Peak. The shining winter sky is close enough to touch, and you who are this sky, no reason to distinguish, for all the stars flow through your veins. A sense of transparency here that uh, Gepser was alluding to. This was in 44, about 15 years before, I'm um, oh, sorry, uh, 15 years, uh, about five or six years before Ever Present Origin. Uh, but Gepser had a series of these experiences, and uh, according to Aaron Sheik, he, uh, Gepser had a kind of spontaneous literary mystical experience in this, in this winter of 44, where he wrote this poem without editing it, and it's a much longer poem that I can do as well, and will also be in the class notes, kind of spontaneous ex spiritual expression or poetic expression of the whole ever-present origin. Um, and then uh, also by Aaron Cheek, uh, relating directly to that quote, is a Rilke poem, uh, and this is a line from the Rilke poem, a single expanse stretches through every being, an interior cosmos, birds fly in silence right through us. So again, there's this sense of, of transparency, there's the importance of the image of the sky, so take that with you as we go into, into integrality. Uh, so very quickly here, uh, Gebser is mentioning another quality of, con of, of this consciousness, uh, where he's saying that mere mental wakefulness is not sufficient to realize the new reality. But again, it's this clarity which is important that sort of sees through the twilight and the darkness that's able to penetrate the whole. And he kind of goes in this kind of beautiful poetic way of describing diaphaneity. Um, and then Feuerstein, who is Gebser's biographer, biographer, who we mentioned in the first class, uh, he's saying also that the breakthrough into the integral aperspectival consciousness, uh, in which Das Geist, Geistig, I don't know how to pronounce that, I'm sorry, uh, which Jen Zart was here, my, my good friend, she could tell me, uh, I think it means the spiritual, in which as the spiritual makes itself known in transparency, cannot be accomplished surreptitiously through drugs, awareness expanding techniques, or technical gadgetry. It requires rather a particular kind of exertion or work, namely the persistent and consistent application of oneself to the rendering transparent of the human personality so that consciousness can coalesce, grow together with the spiritual. And Gebser talks of this task as our inner commission, a mission that goes beyond us. Again, it's this understanding that the human personality won't be diminished. It won't be uh, submerged in a kind of altered state where you lose the self for a little while or a transcendent state where you go beyond the self totally for a while and go into this kind of higher consciousness. There's a kind of bringing an integration of the self, a transparency of the self. So if I haven't brought um, um, 
reemphasize that enough throughout all of opening statements. Um, here's Gepser also saying that in terms of the person, the individual, the integral individual, there is a need for an inner attitude of going beyond oneself by which one becomes capable of devotion or unconditional trust and self-opening, which is characterized by the kind of unintentionalness that has nothing to do with passivity, but that is marked by an unforced, super wakeful lucidity. The apersonal can only be perceived by an apersonal ego-free individual. So I bring all these up because Gebser himself wasn't talking about this abstractly. He was having these um, it, moments, the, the punctuations in his life where this kind of insight kind of came through that broke through his experience, uh, a kind of spiritual experience as you, as you will, uh, the winter poem, a number of other experiences, and then this one, which was interesting, and a little bit later in 1968. Uh, and so after Ever Present Origin was written, Gepser went on this sort of tour of the world, and especially Asia, he, he wanted to get more familiar with uh, Asian philosophy and Asian cultures. And by doing so, he kind of traveled through India, he, he traveled across Asia, and particularly in Sarnath, which is the place where I believe um, the Buddha reached enlightenment, um, he had a kind of peak experience. He had his own kind of Petrarch experience, as we mentioned in the first uh, session, where Petrarch climbs the mountain and has a sort of quote-unquote peak experience pun intended, of the mountain and the realization, uh, the sort of mental wakeful realization of nature, landscape, and space. Uh, Gepser kind of goes to the, uh, the location of the Buddha, and he has this kind of beautiful experience that he, trans, um, that he um, communicates to Feuerstein in a letter, um, uh, which Gepser was a friend of D.T. Suzuki, a famous Buddhist scholar, uh, who kind of helped popularize Buddhism in the West, and he was friends with the, the Beats and Kerouac and, and uh, um, all those folks. And in this correspondence of his, of ex, of his experience, uh, D.T. Suzuki said, you know, that sounds like a Satori experience. So uh, to quote him, to quote, Gep, to quote, to quote Gepser, um, he says, it was sober on the one hand, happening with crystal clarity in which everyday life, which I perceive and to which I reacted to normally, and on the other hand, simultaneously being a transfiguration, an irra irradiation of the indescribable, unearthly, transparent light. No ecstasy, no emotion, but a spiritual clarity, a quiet jubilation, a knowledge of invulnerability, a primal trust. Uh, Gepster goes into primal trust quite a bit. Uh, in other writings, uh, but we won't get into it too much here. I think that's a good expression of it. But if you hear it come up again, that's what he's referring to. Uh, since Sarnath, I am as if recast inwardly. Since then, everything is in its proper place. And it continues to take effect and is in a way an irradiation that is always present and at hand. So he had, as D.T. Suzuki said, a kind of um, mystical experience of this kind of diaphanous understanding that wasn't an ecstatic experience. It was sober. Let, listen to the descriptions. It was sober. It was unearthly, transparent, light, no ecstasy, no emotion. It was clear, a quiet jubilation, a knowledge of invulnerability, a primal trust. There's a kind of subtlety in this sort of this gentle seeing through without any kind of activity, a kind of Taoist passivity, which, as we know, isn't a kind of listlessness, uh, you know, as we would think of in the West. Uh, there's a kind of uh, a spiritual clarity in this understanding here. And, uh, you know, towards the end of his life, as, as we mentioned, Gepser came to appreciate Eastern philosophy and Eastern mysticism because at first he kind of was downplaying it as a sort of mythic, you know, returning to egolessness rather than as sort of going, seeing through the world and allowing the ego to be. There's a lot of writing and interesting philosophical work in Eastern spirituality and Eastern philosophy that is very much uh, an integral expression. So these are just, we're going to share these in the syllabus as well, but this is from uh, a later book, Decline and Participation. And these are just descriptions. Again, these are descriptors for integral consciousness. Uh, uh, you know, they're, they're kind of talking about what we're already saying here. The, the divided human being is replaced by the whole. Uh, you know, uh, quantitative for qualitative spiritual process. So quantitative vital motion replaced by qualitative spiritual process. Manipulation is replaced by the patient acceptance of 
providential powers. Gosh, what a, what a expression there. Uh, mechanistic classification and organization is replaced by the being in order. And uh, a lot of other great examples here. So I'll share that with you later as well. Just to kind of paint, to kind of circumnavigate what integral means. So what we're going to go into now, as we kind of explored some of these initial personal experiences with Kepser. Oh, David, um, decline in participation it has not been translated fully into English, no. Um, give it some time. It might be eventually. <laughs> um, as I mentioned in the first one, Rubito Press and Aaron Cheek, um, and I'm involved in this project myself to some degree because I'm publishing my, my book uh, that's sort of talking about these ideas in this presentation. Um, it's called the Jean Gepser Project, and we are doing some uh, Gepser related books and Aaron himself is translating a few works of Gepser's into English for the first time including one of his earlier books Rilke in, uh, Rilke in Spain. So the idea is to kind of get through the whole bibliography eventually. So hopefully but not quite yet. Um, thanks for asking David that's a great question. So okay now now that we've kind of painted an image of what integral consciousness meant to Gepser, some of his biographical experiences, uh, some of his poetic experiences, and also descriptors for what it means to, you know, to kind of reach this kind of level of sort of spiritual diaphaneity, which he's saying is necessary. And this is the implication here, that this isn't some kind of icing on the cake for planetization or the complexification of our species. This this could be a necessary leap that we must take as a species to sort of attain and realize these dimensions um, in order to flourish, to survive, to, to kind of create the, uh, a livable world that doesn't destroy itself. So there's a kind of, as, as William Irwin Thompson says, up or out scenario here, a kind of intensity and gravity in which a mutation really is a leap. It really is a jump. It, it, is, it is out of necessity, but it is also kind of, you know, to survive, you must recreate yourself. You know, you must remake your life or um, yeah, the Rilke quote, right? You know, you, you must, um, I think it's along those lines, you must remake your life uh, to some degree. So there's this kind of intensity in this that's not just, you know, um, Hallmark cards about, you know, being a so moving from that, though, there's a lot of interesting work about what integral consciousness has meant over the past few hundred years as the sort of decline of the mental rational, the deficient mental rational. Um, yeah, my wife, Natalie, she says, I must change my life. Yeah, I must change my life. Um, so there's a kind of challenge, and that has to do with time. And as we mentioned, time is the expression of the integral, the achrona. Uh, and the eruption of time is sort of the, the quintessential question, the question that we're dealing with in the modern age, uh, as much as the eruption of space, the spatialization of consciousness, the coming to awareness of you know, uh, anatomy and physics and uh, heliocentrism and all of these kind of breakthroughs in art and the Renaissance were happening, that was sort of the realization of space. Uh, and now we are challenged with this realization of time. And what time means isn't just clock time, as we're coming to learn. Uh, just to quote uh, Natsume Soseki in The Wayfarer, man's insecurity stems from the advance of science. Never once has science, uh, which never ceases to move forward, allowed us to pause from walking to rickshaw, from rickshaw to carriage, from carriage to train, from train to automobile, from there on onto the dirigible, further onto the airplane, and further on and on, no matter how far we may go, it won't let us take a breath. So there's a sense that history is speeding up. You know, Walter Benjamin's um, uh, Angel of History, where Walter Benjamin, if you're familiar with uh, this philosopher for the 20th century, Jewish critical uh, theorist, talking about exegetizing uh, a painting by Paul Klee of this angel, very abstract, but he's sort of seeing this angel as an uh, angel of history that's trying to stop the flow of time and 
and stop the catastrophe of history, but you can't. And, and the wind blowing from God moves time forward and moves the complexity of, of history forward into greater and greater catastrophe. Uh, there's a sense of movement, and that's time. That is, is, in some sense, perhaps in the negative, perhaps first in the catastrophe, integral consciousness, before it's the transformation, there's the catastrophe. Um, so uh, Gebser says, what led to the invention of the machine? Breaking forth of time. So we're going to go into this, of course, because to understand the modern age and to really think about today, as Gebser might have tried to do had he lived longer past the 1970s, seen the rise of the computer age and, and you know he was he was in a time when the machine meant motoricity as he used very often in ever present origin uh, but now we're in a time where machine means so much more you know virtuality it means um, all sorts of interesting technological questions and the rise of facebook and social media and the internet and the world wide web a lot has happened so there's a lot to think about and there's a lot to kind of bring gepser uh, into the present for, um, as I will hopefully argue here, and he's very relevant. So, um, so yeah. Be, uh, one of the things that Gepser mentions is that because we're not aware of this eruption of time, because we're still within this mental framework, this mental consciousness, we're trying to, to bracket the problem by spatializing it, by quantifying it, by creating clock time. But time keeps running away, it keeps escaping. It keeps creating more uh, smaller and smaller and smaller microseconds to the, to the point where in the stock market, you know, all of these transactions are happening with the help of AI and these like, microsecond movements that are difficult to compute or even understand. Uh, so there's a sense of time running away. There's a sense of technology and innovation and history running away from us. And this is this this is the for Gebser, this is the inability, this is the deficiency of the mental rational that attempts to hold on to time, to spatialize reality, to 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 fully codify the realization of the sort of secular material uh, mental rationalism. But it keeps running away from us. It keeps escaping us. And, you know, just to mention a few here, you know, Kevin Kelly, he wrote a few years ago, What Technology Wants, and he's using technology in the book as a force of nature. He's describing it as a force that's outside of our control. And uh, another older book he wrote, Out of Control, same thing. Um, this is, you know, this is the beginning of the integral mutation as it manifests negatively and uh, perhaps intentionally, perhaps this is part of these greater workings of nature through the machine. And uh, Gebser uses time as intensity, time as an intensification of consciousness. So we can certainly feel that way in the modern age that there's a kind of intensification taking place. Um, and he, he mentions a few other things, uh, you know, as we mentioned in the last class that, uh, you know, time is the mythic the mythic round, it is the magical timelessness, it is the linear mental, uh, and all of those things, it's motoricity, it's the machine, it's clock time, it's diurnal time, it's our biological rhythm, so time is a sort of multi-dimensional. Um, and with the 20th century, and 19th century, and even 18th century, the invention of the steam engine, the development of all these sort of complexification technologies that you have heard Tehard brings in here, uh, they're kind of, they're, they all kind of appear as a gestalt, as a force that's run away from us, that we're no longer in our control. And he mentions the rise of the left as sort of part of these movements, these sort of rational, liberational movements, and fragmentation as this kind of end game of the mental rational. Could be a good thing as well as a bad thing. Uh, this could all be sort of necessary, paving the way for the imagination of people. Let me just check the comments really quick here. Okay, yeah, sorry, Peter. Um, has anybody else had issues with my microphone? Uh, am I coming across clearly? Just let me know in the chat box really quick before before we move on, um, because uh, you know that wouldn't be good if you couldn't hear me. And I, and again, it could also be because I keep gesticulating and moving my hands and, and moving away from the mic, but I'll try to make sure that I am very close to the mic here. And I'll also try to make sure that I am connected to the right microphone. Okay. 
breaking a bit, but not too bad. Okay. Um, let's see if there is anything I can do here. Okay. Well, I'll try to just stay as close to the microphone and not turn my head and get too carried away. Hopefully that'll help out. If, if not, that could just be internet here, but shouldn't be connected to a good Wi-Fi here. Sorry, folks. Um, so let's move on to Taird. So we're talking about this runaway force of nature. And it's interesting to consider technology as a force of nature. Uh, Gebser also mentions that technology isn't um, something exterior to us, but it is the exteriorization of consciousness. So this kind of runaway force that we see with, with uh, machines, with technology, with the, the you know, population explosion, and all of the things we witnessed in the 18th, 19th, 20th, and now 21st century with technology that's transforming the entire planet um, and, and sometimes almost destroying it, these aspects uh, are all kind of exteriorizations of what's going on in our consciousness. And if that is the case, then it makes a lot of sense what Gebs are saying about how we're wrestling with time or wrestling with this integral a chronon, the sort of infinite force within us. And as we go into some of the uh, contemporary expressions of integrality through art, we're going to see that a lot of them are exploring this sort of leap into the hyperdimensional as well. So uh, New Genesis rises upward. This is Tehard uh, talking now uh, and linking him with, with Gebser. Uh, New Genesis rises upwards in us, through, uh, in us and through us unceasingly. The closer association of the grains of thought, the synthesis of individuals and of nations or races, the need of an autonomous and supreme personal focus to bind elementary personalities together without deforming them. In an atmosphere of active sympathy, and once, and once again, all this results from the, combina the combined action of two curvatures, the roundness of the earth and the cosmic convergence of mind in conformity with the law of complexity and consciousness. Now, all of this is really saying for Teilhard um, that there's this kind of swelling and, and sort of intensification of human technology, of human consciousness as they kind of swirl together. New innovations, uh, railways, airplanes, uh, the, you know, electronic culture, as Marshall McLuhan would, would describe it, as a sort of bringing together of communication on the planet and travel and all these other technologies are kind of bringing this sort of intensification. So as things become more complex, there's this intensification of consciousness taking place. And I think uh, Teilhard is really describing a similar movement that Gebser is describing in this sort of time eruption, kind of eruption of the A integral A chronon, the integral A perspectival. Uh, now he's kind of just going on here about this sort of, I won't go into the whole thing here, but he's saying there's this kind of spiritual purpose behind this movement. This isn't just the deficient mental trying to grasp the integral. This is a birth process. This is a kind of evolutionary leap into this new consciousness where the tension is necessary to kind of push this whole thing into being. And he's, you know, he's describing it as the fulfillment of the spirit of the earth, the end of the world, the wholesale internal introversion upon itself of the new sphere. And Teilhard was describing new sphere as this kind of thinking layer of the earth, but it's not just a mundane concept as, oh, you know, there's the biosphere and then there's culture, so there's the new sphere. It's, it's this kind of infinite mind. It's the logos that's trying to incarnate into the world. So uh, Teilhard has, is a very, um, he's this kind of Christian evolutionary mysticism at work here. Um, so yeah, so he's talking about the new sphere, which has simultaneously reached the uttermost limits of its complexity and its centrality, detaching the mind fulfilled at last from its material matrix so that it will henceforth rest with all its weight on God Omega. And this is quite an eschatological view that, you know, we're going to trans matter itself will self transcend as it realizes it's, it's God nature in this new singularity. Uh, Taird was a mystic and he has quite a vision of the future and a quite a vision of the evolution of consciousness and evolution of life. And we're going to come back to this because this is something that starts to crop up a lot. Um, not just with Taird, but with a lot of contemporary um, mystics and contemporary artists who, 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 who get a whiff of this kind of vision of this sort of evolutionary birthing process um, in which you see the whole and you see what is, at, what is at work in the whole. 
Um, and here's just, I won't quote the whole thing, but uh, this is Gepser in Ever Present Origin, who mentions very directly uh, Sri Aurobindo and Tierra de Chardin here as people who were talking about the same thing. So Gepser himself was saying, you know, I am coming from Europe and writing about the Occident and writing about Rilke in Spain and this new consciousness that I've noticed here, but this new consciousness is, is popping up everywhere. Look at this Catholic priest. Look at this uh, Indian yogi who's talking about integral yoga. Go read them too. So, you know, as, as someone who's interested in this, you know, you really have to kind of, um, even if you anchor yourself in a particular tradition or scholar, somebody you're studying, it's very important to kind of look at uh, who they're parallel with and, and what they are saying as well, because it can really kind of balance out uh, your own understanding and complement where there are sort of missing pieces. So the kind of uh, evolutionary genesis component, which is very mystical and visionary, those are more so in Sri Aurobindo and uh, Teilhard de Chardin, less so in, in Gepser, because Gepser is a little bit more apprehensive about kind of creating some large trajectory for the whole planet. Um, even though so much of his work kind of implicates that after very careful, careful discernment. So, so that's, that's some links and connections there. And if everybody, I hope everybody can hear me okay. I'm just going to uh, drop in here and just make sure. Uh, if you can't, let me know. Um, I'll just unplug this microphone and use the, the Mac microphone, which um, isn't as good, but, you know, maybe it'll work better. So uh, yeah, just let me know in the chat box if, if uh, I'm still cutting out a little bit. Um, so now we're going to go into the time play of the structures. And so part of what Gepser said, as we mentioned earlier, audio is decent. Um, OK. So let me, just, let me just unplug it. How about now, now, guys? Is this any better? Testing, testing, integral consciousness. If this is better, let me know. I'm using these ear pods, and they're weird. But um, they're closer to my face, at least, than this old microphone. Yes, this is better. Great. Good, good. Either is adequate. OK, thanks, Patricia. OK, thanks, guys. Okay, so we're gonna stick with this for now. The time play of the integral structures. And so as I mentioned that uh, the structures need to all come online in the integral, and that's an aspect of what's going on with the integral, is that there's a sort of non-linearity of time. The whole of time is, is sort of expressing itself. And with the mental, the deficient mental, it's, it's so exclusive in the sense that it doesn't realize how much it depends on the magical and the mythical structures, the unconscious and sort of the twilight consciousness, the altered states. Um, so much so that, you know, in, in some ways it becomes uh, subject to the dominance of the unconscious to inform it. And as you see in a lot of uh, interesting writings, especially I think in, in the writings of Deleuze as a contemporary philosopher, uh, there's this relationship with the with the, the the witch's flight, as he says, and even Descartes had his at his dream of the angel who came to him to reveal, you know, the empirical method. Um, so it's a sort of this understanding of 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 the unconscious as sort of the the un, the shadow of the mental, the shadow of the mental rational, as it sort of tries to push away and keep away this sort of twilight consciousness, the mythic and the magical, uh, to exclusively focus on the mental and the mental rational. Uh, but that, of course, changes, and the relationship, as we see, is changing as well. So what we begin to see in the, in the integral structure is that a lot of the older structures start popping up where you least expect them. Or you think it's one thing, and then it sort of turns inside out and becomes something else. And I mentioned this in previous versions of this talk. Um, the idea that uh, we're retrieving the world as caves. So remember the magical and the archaic began in, in this sort of inception point in the, in the caves of Lasso and Chauvet and this sort of primordial consciousness that, uh, that is sort of zero dimensional at one point is, is 
equal to all other points. And what's important is the psychic component of the world in which all things are related to all other things. Uh, now we're sort of beginning to retrieve things. And, I, and you know, you, you might argue that this is sort of a, an unconscious retrieval, a, a way in which the modern mental consciousness through its technology, through its secularism, is attempting to retrieve magic and mythic and theology and religiosity. Um, and the, num the, the cases here are just so numerous and so uh, diverse. It's kind of, you know, it would be its own talk and its own, really its own book. And I recommend actually Eric Davis and Technosis for a book that explores this idea that the technological secular Silicon Valley is sort of obsessed with sort of reimagining and recreating itself in the image of magicians and of magic and um, sort of retrieving the Gnostic, the Gnostic uh, um, theological drama of sort of escaping the physical world and transcending into, into the world of light and logos. But of course, in a very technological metaphor, of course, you know, through uh, transcendence, like the film transcendence and, um, the idea of uploading your consciousness into machines and these kinds of these kinds of gnostic flights from matter uh, are very much parallel to sort of the older theological, religious, and magic and mythical consciousness. Um, but we're going to bring in McLuhan here because McLuhan is very helpful, and Thompson uses McLuhan with Gebser as well. Um, and this is from his his most known book, I think, uh, "The Medium Is the Message." And he's talking about reversals, how a thing becomes its opposite. He says, the greatest of all reversals occurred with electricity. And that ended sequence by making things instant. With instant speed, the causes of things began to emerge into awareness again, as they had not done with things in sequence. And again, that, that mental rational linearity in sequence and in conca concatenation accordingly. Instead of asking which came first, the chicken or the egg, it suddenly seemed that a chicken was an egg's idea for getting more eggs. So again, is this time play starting to take place here? Uh, and here he's talking about the sound barrier. And he's saying, you know, just as, you know, an airplane is about to hit the sound barrier, sound becomes visible on the wings of the plane. And the sudden visibility of sound, just as sound ends, is an apt instance of that great um, reversal so it reveals in something new through the opposite forms, just as the earlier forms reached their peak uh, performance. Mechanization was never so vividly fragmented or sequential as in the birth of the movies. And movies, if you think about it, are they're very they used to be very linear in the sense that it was uh, you know snapshot snapshot movement in a very linear way. But you speed up that movement enough, and something different takes place. So he's saying the moment that translated us beyond mechanism into the world of growth and organic interrelation. The movie, by sheer speeding up of the mechanical, carried us from the world of sequence and connections into the world of creative configuration and structure. We returned to the inclusive form of the icon. And gosh, McLuhan was uh, quite, a, quite a writer himself here. Um, so he's saying with electronic technology, with the kind of machine age, we're bringing back these sort of mythical and magical, magical structures of consciousness, and they're coming out through the technology, through the machine. And here's a good example. You know, we have the cave of Lasso and, and Chauvet, and now, interestingly, in a very different way, we're returning to the cave. And the cave is in a literal mythical, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's not stone, um, but it is mineralogical. Um, it is something that relies on sort of underground uh, rare elements and everything else. As Android Jones mentions, there's an element of our technology that we don't really think about that is very subterranean. Uh, and he calls his form of art, which is completely digital, uh, electromineralism. This idea that to be aware of the processes and, the, and ground this virtual art in its source, which is sort of these rare elements. Um, but again, here is the, here is the cave. Here is the return of the individual to the cave through virtual reality. And uh, my friend, I don't know if he's on tonight, Nick and I talk about this quite a lot, how there's this interesting in antiodromia and return and retrieval of this mythical magical consciousness through virtual reality as a good example. So just to list these things off really quick. So the return of the cavern, right? So it's the return of this night twilight consciousness. Um, as an enclosed space, but it's not a finite space, it's a psychic reality. 
And if there is any parallels between the old magical mythical consciousness and this new virtual reality, it is this, it is this psychic reality. It is this sort of sense that it's not physical stuff in which you are, are traveling through and navigating through. It's, it's kind of, it's made out of psychic stuff. It's made out of mind stuff. And a lot of our technologies are sort of bringing forth mind stuff into the world in a weird way. Um, as you mentioned already, uh, you know, this is exteriorization through technology. This is no longer something that we are, we have truly have, have within ourselves and are looking out at the world and are perceiving the world through this phenomenological structure. And now those, those hidden phenomenologies that have been so buried for so long are kind of uh, um, coming out through us. And they're, they're kind of spontaneously arising through us, even as we think consciously we're doing something else. Um, another aspect of this, and we're going to go into this a little bit now too, the time play here beyond the structures kind of all coming online and line and playing with each other, um, is the forms of art themselves are expressing this time play and this sort of time freedom. Uh, we're going to go into that too. I mentioned combinatorial creativity here. Uh, that's a sort of a way to understand knowledge. The construction of knowledge is very, it's sort of a up and coming term for sort of understanding the way in which information is expressed and creatively re reworked so that you no longer see the sort of, uh, modernist individual as the, the sort of learned person who comes forward with all of this knowledge, but you see them as a kind of web of interrelationships of all of these different qualities that are coming into play. Um, and the cut-up method is that literary method that uh, William S. Burroughs helped to pioneer, and that sort of anticipated uh, assemblages with Deleuze and the sort of network theory and the internet age and internet culture and decentralization, I think, is the key word here with all of these different things. Um, and of course, the, uh, the world of the icon is back. The language in which we're using, and Gepster was very careful with looking at language, is, tra is changing and transforming. Emojis are a great example. GIFs are another great example. Memes are another great example. There's so much coded into the language and the linguistics, especially with memes. So many layers of semiotics of meaning that it's kind of hard to unpack uh, in a quick rundown here. But the takeaway right now is that language has evolved, and drastically so, since Gepser was writing, you know, a few hundred page tome. The age of the text, is, in a sense, is over. The whole world has become a sort of semiotic text in which we're constantly reading um, iconography and translating it with each other. Um, here's an example. So we're going to get some more examples now. Uh, this is some interesting photography. I'm not sure about the one on the left where that one is taking place. Um, but as a sort of a mundane, a motif, as Gepser would say, we're talking about motifs. Um, motifs are, are in one sense, kind of like, OK, whatever. There's, there's plenty of photoshopped images today, right? Um, or if you're looking at a uh, an ornate um, Greek pottery design, you might say, okay, there's a leaf motif of an individual who's kind of entwined in the leaves. Well, Gepser would say, well, we need to look at that more carefully and think about phenomenologically what that means. It may be something mundane and something that's a motif and, and repeated everywhere, but it, it implies something about our consciousness. So the fact that we're beginning to play with time in a kind of mundane way with this, with remixing and music and all sorts of different types of media we're beginning to play with time. Our consciousness is beginning to play with time in a creative and artistic way. And which I think Gepster would say, you know, you look to the artist to begin to discern what's going on with consciousness and where it's headed. So this, there's this kind of early latent nascent playing of, of, of time freedom here. Um, and there's a kind of intensity in these images. If we just take a uh, step back and look at them for a moment, uh, you can sense the gravity, especially with the image on the left with the soldiers marching. You don't know where they're marching to. It's probably in a time of war. And the kind of, you know, every day, whatever, just drive down the streets. It's, it's no longer a place of, of any kind of warfare going on or kind of great historical event happening. Um, but by overlaying the two images together, and the one on the right, of course, is so striking with the dead horses. And the, this is a San Francisco image of the great San Francisco earthquake in the early 20th century, um, spliced with, you know, 20, 2012, 2013, a few years ago when this was taken. Um, 
there's this sense of the presence of the past, but there's also a sense of the presence of the future on the past. There's an interesting overlay or intersplicing of time here. And that's the point. That's sort of the emphasis here in this, in this expression of, of time play and integral art. There's a little bit more. Uh, again, this is the San Francisco one, individual walking down with the trolleys on the left. And as you kind of go into the horizon, it becomes the past. Um, which is interesting. And I don't know if the trolleys are going up or down. I imagine they're going up uh, towards us, just based on the lady standing in the trolley there. But um, this is still is kind of an interesting movement of, of uh, the depth being time and the present kind of coming up at us more directly in a, more, in a closer way. And then from the left to the right, um, again, it's just kind of like, you know, from, from yesterday into today, this movement from the left to the right into the present uh, as, the, as San Francisco burns in this earthquake. Um, there's a kind of intensity here. There's a kind of hauntingness. Uh, the past is never dead, right? I forget which poet said that. Was it T.S. Eliot? Um, there's a sense of time being present and the sense that the linearity of time is less important than the kind of intensity and presence of different qualities of time as they overlay with each other are diaphanous to each other. The past and the present become transparent in these images. And I don't know if we have time for, for these, um, but I would recommend Pogo as a good musical accompany, accompaniment here. And I'll, le I'll link these as well in the syllabus, which will go online tomorrow on the class portal page. Um, but Pogo, he takes uh, Disney movies and popular culture films, and he'll, he'll sample not... <laughs> My wife is saying just to play it. Maybe I should. Okay, guys. Um, let's see if we can do this one second. I will share. Yeah. Here's a good one. This is Lord of the Rings. Um, he samples movies and he basically takes a film and takes sounds from the film and puts them together in his music and he, he kind of creates a larger gestalt, which in some way kind of expresses uh, wordlessly the, the, the soul of the film, uh, the, the, the depth of a character, the, the movement of a film, uh, kind of the more wordless aspects of a film that are expressed by deconstructing the voices and the words so that they're no longer nouns, but intensities. And if you remember what Gebser was saying about the evolution of language in Rilke in Spain, it's this idea that it's no longer about nouns and objects, but the relationship between objects, the sort of living intensities um, that becomes important. So I'm gonna play, I'll just play a little bit of this for you. Just 
Just time. Just Um, so again, there's the, you know, the words are deconstructed and decomposed and that's an element of the sort of time play that's going on. Um, in the sense that it's again, no longer important about the object of perception of the mental rational object of an object in space that's definable, that is, uh, that has finite contours and can be understood through the perception of the eye or the abstract conception. Of, of the noun, but now it's about the space between the, the, um, the objects, the intensity. And as we're gonna learn later, the transparency of the objects themselves as they become unknowable. So um, again, this is a motif that is very mundane and everyday, and there's tons of remixing art and multimedia that's already out there. Um, but as a force, as a creative force, this is what we're doing. We're breaking down the kind of composed finite objects of art and consciousness and culture in the mental civilization that we've sort of blown up into over the 20th century and we're kind of deconstructing it and we're becoming what we're it's more about the network the relationship between things the 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 movement between things and the sort of the gap between the knowable and the unknown so um let me go back to the slides here time play what we were going over. So more motifs, right, of the interval. Um, so one of the things I've kind of been playing around with in this presentation is this idea that we're jumping from, uh, uh, we're breaking down space and space is becoming blown up. Uh, space is becoming blown up into hyperspace, into this sort of multi-dimensionality. And in some ways, this is not the clear, calm, lucidity of, of Gepser's description of the integral. This is a lot messier. This is a lot noisier. This is a lot more, dare we say, pl playful in the sense of just sort of, uh, kind of, um, uh, just sort of a messy dynamic play of something that's already breaking down anyway. Um, but I think to some degree, this is where we're at. And a lot, one of the things Gepser also mentioned and Sri Aurobindo also mentioned, is this idea that as consciousness evolves, as it mutates, there are these in-between moments, there are these transitional moments between the new and the old, where it seems to be a mix of both, to become Janus-based. And so to some degree, this may seem like a kind of exploded mental consciousness that's sort of falling apart and there's all these dimensions and it's, it's, it's noisy, right? But, uh, you know, noise is important in the evolution of consciousness. Noise becomes signal. It, it, it gets reworked and recombined. And I think that's the point of a lot of the remix culture is to translate the sort of decomposing uh, trash heap of a civilization as it becomes efficient and reworking it with a kind of renewed spiritual principle that's creative and, and fresh and nascent. So anyway, here's... Um, Android Jones again with electro mineral mineralism and his microdoses VR. This is kind of bringing together a few different things. As you notice, the image in this one is is kind of a, it's in a dome, a three dimensional dome. And when you're in virtual reality, as a good example here, uh, you you are in a sense in a dome in the sense that uh, the graphics are are overlaid in a sort of domeish kind of experience. That it's not really meant to look like a dome, but you can kind of tell in some cases like this one that it is. Um, so it's just kind of an interesting aspect here of the sort of cave dome, virtual dome, virtual space. In old video games, it was much more apparent where, you know, um, uh, the event horizon, horizon was literally a pixel painting of a mountain on a flat surface, uh, meant to create a sense of, uh, of depth from afar. Um, so, but th this is kind of actively using that dome as almost a, almost a kind of sacred space, a kind of cathedral virtual cathedral. Um, here's a literal dome where that is all kind of playing out and projected onto the screen here. Um, again, this sort of mythical electronic retrieval of the cave. Um, and again, here, here is the interesting motif that I, that I find to be relevant for us tonight. 
Um, and this is the album Forward Escape. It's a Tipper album, electronic music as well, which uses all these different sounds. Um, uh, but here's a, a human being and their head is sort of exploding into hyperspace. And here's another one, uh, Ar Arshanair, who's one of uh, Nura's teachers actually, um, who had a class with us as well about his work, his artistic process. Um, another one, a few more. There's a motif, it's very common, it's very popular. You know, Nura uses it for some of their social media posts. And so the question is, well, what is this motif saying about consciousness? Um, and so I'm making the connection here with what Gebser was saying about the eruption of the mental from the mythical with the, with the story of Zeus birthing Athena through splitting open his head. And now we're kind of having this new split, uh, but it's not the, it is not a kind of a retrieved um, uh, uh, Zeus mythos in the sense that it's just rehashing the, the eruption of the mental consciousness, the eruption of space. It's now the eruption of hyperspace. It's the eruption of the hyperdimensional, the acronon, the infinite. And it's kind of being expressed in a very complex, messy, noisy way, in a very kind of almost mental, rational way, the kind of like fragmentation, complexity, uh, a lot of, lot of things going on to cognize in an image. Um, and to some degree, I think some of us really feel that way with the internet age and the information overload. But again, it's this idea that there's something that's breaking through. Space is being punctured. Space is being erupted by this larger hyperspace, this hyperdimensionality. And I have this here, of course, uh, just a good image uh, comic book. We're going to be playing now with different dimensions. You know, here's a two-dimensional image representing hyperspace, a hyperdimensional uh, multi-reality of all these different timelines. Um, Crisis on Infinite Earths. This is from 1985, DC comic. Uh, but it's this, you know, this idea that there's all of these different dimensions with different different qualities of time all taking place simulta simultaneously. Um, and again, this is a science fiction comic book trope, a motif that's telling us something about what's going on with our consciousness. This is another contemporary thing, not a comic book, but Rick and Morty, if, for those of you who have seen it, it's also playing with this idea of like the self in a, this multidimensional space of infinite selves and how to sort of navigate that um, in a very fun and silly way. But um, I recommend watching that too, if you like that kind of humor. Uh, my wife and I really love the show. For, those, for me, for those reasons, uh, the way it's playing with um, navigating selfhood in, in multidimensional, hyperdimensional reality, in which our own world itself is beginning to feel that way with Facebook and social media and everybody in their own reality tunnels and so on. So again, there's this kind of overwhelmingness. There's this kind of, whoa, so much is happening all at once. What do I do? Um, it could be a mystical experience, but it could also be an overwhelming experience that's you know, experienced negatively. And for um, this next example, uh, next contemporary example, Philip K. Dick, relig <laughs> religious experience of Philip K. Dick, um, as a kind of postmodern gnosis, which is both uh, a combination of, of uh, hallucinatory, uh, paranoid experience and a, a, an absolutely transcendent uh, mystical experience that Philip K. Dick had. Um, so if you're not familiar with him, uh, we're actually going to have a class on him at the end of the month with Richard Doyle, who's going to be coming on for about six or seven weeks. This is going to be one of the free classes you can sign up for, uh, you know, donation based. And um, he's going to go into some of these aspects in a, in a lot deeper way. Um, but the connection here is that he was a science fiction writer. And uh, Jeffrey Kripal brings this up that, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the transformations of consciousness taking place today and the theological and religious experiences of our time have to be sublimated through science, through the kind of guise of, of materialism and the sort of scientific imaginary of science fiction, which is the sort of playground for all of these ideas. Uh, they all kind of creep back in. So, um, so Philip K. Dick was a science fiction writer who was playing with a lot of these ideas. He was very much foreshadowing our sort of postmodern reality that we're in right now. Um, writing about this in the 60s and 70s, but uh, he had a, a very important date where this experience happened to him, 374, uh, the 3rd of February in 1974, which uh, he had recently done uh, some dental work. He was in a lot of pain and he was waiting for some pain medication. 
uh, a woman shows up to give him his pain medication and he has this interesting experience because she's wearing a necklace um, with a Christian fish on it. And there's something about the light, the reflection of the light in his eye and the, the moments afterwards, after he closes the door, he has this kind of um, uh, science fiction uh, Gnostic Paul experience where this pink, Gnostic light beams and telegraphs all of this information just directly into his mind, which he interprets as the logos. Uh, and he later writes and autobiographically uh, embeds into some of his sci-fi writing through the works of Vallis. Uh, we might do a book club for Vallis later this year. Um, but he has this kind of postmodern mystical experience where he's using science fiction metaphors, but he ends up digging through religious texts. He ends up digging through theological texts and part of the ex experience is the sort of eruption of the acronon, the eruption of seeing the earth as this kind of evolutionary gestation, this mutation point. Um, and here he is talking about Vallis and talking about Teilhard. I don't wanna go into this too deeply for this class, but just to kind of link him here as somebody who's sort of in this larger literary, um, uh, I don't know what you would call it, a hypertext, of this sort of integral evolutionary mysticism that's taking place here. Um, and basically, you know, he's saying that there's some kind of impulse in life that he feels he came in contact with, this sort of divine mind, this new spheric uh, uh, logos of Tehard that's working through evolution, working through the whole of time to bring something forth. Uh, putting in his rational and logos, but he's using rationality not the way Gebser does with the mental rational, obviously, but more of a kind of divine rationality, a divine higher mind. Um, and he's saying, of course, the same thing. And of course, um, now, interestingly, uh, Philip K. Dick did not, he's aware of Tear, but he wasn't aware of Aurobindo, but I think he would get a lot out of Aurobindo because Aurobindo talked very directly about that kind of download experience he had. And as we know, Urbindo was one of these writers that Gebser himself made a direct connection to saying, this guy is talking about it and in a much broader way, in a much uh, deeper way and more thorough. And I think Gebser is being humble there, but at the same time, Urbindo has this kind of evolutionary psychology in a way of, of these series of involuting uh, forms of higher mind that integrate and bring down and concretize in the human being, these spiritual realities that concretize in the human. Um, and he sort of sees the whole of life as this kind of evolutionary gestation of this logos or divine mind, this new sphere, as Tehard would say. So there's links here and there's connections here. My next example, uh, Grant Morrison and Grant, Grant Morrison's Petrarch moment. Um, so another guy who, who uh, is an artist rather than particularly a, uh, a theologian or, or scholar of consciousness. Um, but, you know, he's, he, he practiced magic. He studied, he studied magic. He studied occultism. He studied these sorts of interesting consciousness related things. Uh, he was a comic book artist. He was very famous for doing uh, Arkham Asylum in the 80s and a few other uh, very notable comic books. More recent one would probably be All-Star Superman. Uh, but he has this experience in Kathmandu, which, again, was this sort of religious peak experience in which he, he in a sense, I guess, encountered these otherworldly beings. And again, he's saying he wasn't on any psychedelics. Um, so this happened completely sober to him. Uh, he was visiting Kathmandu, again, moving through uh, Asia, searching, I guess, on a kind of pilgrimage before he was going to start working on the invisibles which is an interesting text in and of itself we could do a class on. Um, and he had this kind of peak experience with seeing these beings, with, with having this kind of, I'm just going to read part of this, um, because it reads like a, like a trip. It re reads like a DMT trip or a psychedelic experience. And it's kind of interesting, but it ties back in with what we're saying here, about sort of fake chronon. Um, yeah, he, he brought into this space. It was a vaulted infinity, he describes it. Uh, the space is a profound azure blue in all directions, laced with bright silver lines and grid tr uh, traceries that came and went, ghost blueprints zipping up and down and invisible monofilament scaffolding all around me. Stranger yet, my arrival in this place felt like a homecoming. 
all the cares and fears of the mortal world were gone, replaced by the hum of immaculate industry. Divine creativity reminds you a little bit of William Blake there, right? Um, I was a mercurial hypersprite too, and he describes these beings that these people hypersprites. Don't ask me what that means. Um, and remember that I had always been. There was time and space, but those were lower dimensions, useful for creating worlds in the same way that comic artists drew living worlds on paper. Here was an unending perfect day of absorbing eternal creation. And this is the interesting part. Time was a kind of incubator. and All of life on Earth was one thing, a weird an enemy like Mega Hydra with its single celled immortal root in the Precambrian tides and its billion and its billion of sensory branches from ferns to people, with every single detail having its own part to play in the life cycle of a slowly complexifying, increasingly self aware superorganism. It was as if I had been shown an infant god attached to a placental support system called Earth. I could see the shapes of things and of people as the late plain surfaces of a far more complex and elaborate processes occurring in a higher dimensional location. Every human life became a trailing extension through time, not just four-limbed and two-eyed, but multi-limbed and billion-eyed. Here's some samples from The Invisibles where, like Philip K. Dick, this artist, um, as like a lot of the artists in ever-present origin uh, that Gepser mentions, uh, trying to translate his experience through creative work. Um, so there's this kind of time traveling aspect you don't really need to know about with the plot, but here he is attempting to express that sort of time worm, the self as it moves through time as this larger whole. And of course on the right, you should know by now, you should know now that nothing begins nor does it end, things are ever present. Um, and there's an interesting time play in that issue too. So it's not just talking about the timeless now, it's, it has the past, present, and future wrapped up in that, in that sort of story here. Um, just sort of another example here, and he's trying to play with the language there and the sentence structure, and sort of making it a nonlinear expression of, of, of her as a sort of time-free being attempting to relate back with time. Um, and I'll leave the details of that for you to read if you'd like. But um, the idea here is that here are artists that are trying to express time freedom, time play, it from motif to the truly transcendent and mystical in terms of science fiction, and comic book writing. And you know, here's to, to kind of you know really rail it in here. We are uh, this is Gepser. We are confronted here with the eruption of the fourth dimension into three dimension into the three dimensional world, which in its first outburst shatters this three-dimensional world. So again, it's this, this shattering, right? This, um, we go back, it's the shattering, it's this explosion, it's this fourth dimension eruption that's breaking through, that's breaking free of uh, space as the need for space um, in, a, in, a, in a sense of the mental rational structure. Um, so what else here? We have a few, a little bit longer for films, but I just want to uh, mention here, if you do have any questions, um, you know, we'll probably go until nine or so. Um, if you do have any questions, uh, do let me know in the chat box or raise your hand. Um, easiest way for me to get your question is the Q&A box or the chat box. So even comments would be great here. Um, and if you have your own examples, I would love to hear them because that's half of the reason why I'm doing this class is to kind of get more, um, understanding of where we are right now in consciousness and culture. And I think the only way to really do that is to look at art and to look at manifestations, especially in art. Um, but you know, I'm just one person, so I can't really know everything that's going on. And it's always fun to kind of hear what other people are asking, what they're picking up on, what on their radar. Um, but all that being said, leave your questions in the comment box or the Q&A box. And uh, okay, so we're gonna go into some films here. Uh, the first one, Interstellar, I'm just going to mention briefly. Again, it's science fiction, and the motif of time and time travel in science fiction is is sort of so overdone that it's it's almost you know you know nobody would think really about what's so interesting about that unless you're taking this bigger, broader perspective of this sort of time eruption as the manifestation of the integral. Um, but Interstellar might be an, an ex exemption from that because of how interestingly it is without ruining too much, and I guess spoiler alert from here on out with some of these things, 
um, because I have to talk about some of these films to kind of express to you what's going on with them integrally. Uh, but Interstellar is all about the future influencing the past. Um, and it's all about kind of the reaching back into the past for our species to be pulled forward through time as a kind of evolutionary leap being helped out by the latency and potency of the future. Uh, and there's a lot of interesting time play in that. I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, but the ending is great, and it's a great kind of tr attempt to to artistically render hyperspace or the fourth dimension as as a um, multi-dimensional plane. Um, I'm going to leave it there. A very 2001 kind of blow your mind ending there. Um, now Akira is a little older, but I I love Akira because this particular film really expresses this transitional. This, this, this transitional space between the mental rational and this sort of leap into the integral. And so the main character, one of the main characters, Tetsuo, um, it's in this sort of cyberpunk future mega city, this Neo Tokyo, and Tetsuo is this little, he's a little punk, he's, a, he's, in, a, he's in a street gang with, with his friend Canada. Um, and uh, through a bizarre accident, he, he kind of, uh, through fate, he crashes into this little kid who's the psychic who escaped from a lab, very, very anime, and he's got all these superpowers. And through that kind of crash, that accident on the street in the beginning of the film, he becomes, he, his own superpower, his own psychic ability starts to become unleashed. He mutates, as it were, to borrow a Gibsarian phrase here, and there's a mutation. And um, he, he gets carried away with the mutation it becomes a force that he can no longer control by the end of the film so that it, it sort of run away with him quite literally, as you can see in uh, the image down there. Um, he becomes this kind of biological mechanical monster that's just sort of unleashing the force of, uh, uh, forces of technology and biology in this sort of endless sprawl. Um, and the only way he's able to really tame this is through Akira, who is this, uh, predecessor of this laboratory who was able to figure out to some degree um, how to master the unleashing of a sort of infinite power in the human consciousness. And there's a lot of interesting metaphors that are used to the film about uh, bacteria and biology and you know what would a what would a single celled bacteria do with if it had the consciousness of a human being like uh, leaps and leaps ahead in evolutionary complexity in the same way what do we do when we mutate and there's this higher consciousness, this more intensified consciousness within us, and we're attempting to control it through this lower consciousness, this ego, right? We're trying to master time freedom and ego freedom through time and through the ego, and it doesn't work. It creates the sort of monstrous explosion, a runaway force. So again, a great film that really, I think, expresses implicitly the shift from the mental to the integral and the sort of um, crisis that the mental encounters as it leaps into the integral and with a pretty neat ending that you can read there or wait till you watch it. Um, I'm not going to play the clip because we need to run out of time. Um, but I'll save that as well for the links. And um, so Arrival is another good film. And this came out last year. And this is based on a short story that I can't remember the title for at the moment. Um, um, but basically, it's an interesting first contact film, again, science fiction. Uh, and it's about this linguist who, who is brought into a team to figure out uh, how to communicate with this alien race that's landed on the planet. Um, and they have a different language, and she has to study the language. But through studying the language, she, she, her own consciousness begins to transform. And, uh, you know, the, the ending has everything to do with time and the achronon. And sort of the language of these these aliens uh, is able to transform our consciousness so that we can see past, present, and future as as a whole. As you can see, circularity. Um, there's there's, trans, there's a kind of slightly occluded glass here that's in the image in the room where they're speaking with the aliens. And I think it's kind of an interesting play with this idea of of working towards diaphanity through this sort of transparency. And while these are circles and uh, not spheres, I think there's a sphericity to their language that is implicating a kind of wholeness of time. Um, again, and, th and that's the answer to the problems of you know, the global crisis in the film, is that this kind of integral, aperspectival 
time-free consciousness is what's needed to solve a planetary crisis. You know, the whole planet's arming itself and nobody's communicating, right? And it's this kind of leap that's necessary to understand and, and create this new mutation structure. And to kind of wrap up here, this is the last, one of the last examples. Uh, Annihilation, um, that's coming out actually next month. And we're doing another class on, on this. Uh, this is going to be with Jen Zart and I. We're going to do a class on the Southern Reach Trilogy. We're going to basically going to be a book club study class. And um, basically, what's interesting about this, the film and the book, I'm going to mention the book in a moment, too, uh, is that the book and the film are exploring the non-human world, right? So it's about this biologist who uh, is a, in a scientific team that goes into this strange alien territory. There's something weird going on in this sort of fictional area, uh, geographical area of the United States, um, loosely based on Florida, interestingly enough, since Vandermeer is a Floridian. It's called Area X. Uh, the laws of nature don't apply. Uh, the laws of reason and rationality don't apply. There's a hyper-reality there's an uncanniness to all things, and the writer is really good at sort of portraying that uncanniness of anything, of anything, any object. Um, and you know, as it turns out, when we're there, when we're there long enough, we begin to become uncanny ourselves. So there's this kind of there's this implication of of the nature of of the human being as as not even knowing itself, as this sort of unknowability, this sort of weird consciousness, right? So, um, and again, there's this idea of this mutation, this leap into the non-human and the non-human world. Um, and, you know, it's been called kind of like a, a story about the Anthropocene, um, but I want to go into this first as a sort of the last topic, you know, our, this is going to be the capstone for everything tonight. Um, so we looked at some examples in art. We looked at uh, combinatorial creativity and networks and time play and remixing and sort of motif of, of this leap into hyperspace, this kind of motif of time as a whole and seeing the sort of planetary evolution as a whole through these mystical experiences. But then we've also got in the humanities and a little bit more of a, um, I wouldn't say tame, but not as uh, explicitly evolutionary in, in a mystical way. Um, we have object-oriented ontology going on as a sort of development in the humanities and in English and philosophy. And, you know, this among other things, which is interesting right now, there's panpsychism, which is becoming popular among secularists now, uh, which I find to be just fascinating, mind-blowing. Um, there's this turn toward the immaterial. There's this turn toward uh, seeing objects as these unknowable things and the transparency of objects and the strangeness of being. And um, this all has to do with ecology and kind of coming to consciousness of the rest of the ecosphere, and not just about humanity, not just about what we're evolving into, but moving into uh, becoming present with the other in, in every sense of that word. Um, yeah, so this is Tim Morton talking about it. And, and really a takeaway here is that uh, object-oriented ontology holds that things exist in a profoundly withdrawn way. They cannot be splayed open in the sort of the mental, rational grasping, right? Um, by anything, including themselves. You can't know a thing fully by thinking it or eating it or by measuring it or by painting it. This means that the way things affect one another cannot be direct, mechanical, but rather indirect or vicarious. Causality is aesthetic. So again, there's this movement from objects and nouns and objectivity to this kind of weirdness to things. Um, and Morton's talking about art, and again, he's, he's in a way he's talking about a perspectivity, I think, with this philosophical idea, and the sort of art of, of hyper objects, which are any object, anything which is bigger on the inside than the outside, which is stranger and occluded um, and, and unknowable, and sort of infinite. It's got that Rilke's infinite sky within it. Um, so he's writing, an art of the time of hyper objects is an art that explores the uncanniness of being uniqueness of the, the irony of interrelationships between again very similar to I guess we're talking in Roca and Spain. Art that explores the hyper objects appear spontaneously within contemporary art and human artists did nothing to make them appear. And I think that's really important as maybe one last thing, uh, criteria for Gepser is understanding that these movements of consciousness are not ours in the sense that 
you know, we are the ones who are coming up with this new development, a lot of the times, and as you've seen here in these examples, especially the artistic ones, these individuals are being compelled to express something in them. They are almost being possessed by a thing. Even when it comes to the, um, the, the sort of running away of technology and time in the modern age, we, we in no way are really controlling or mastering that. It's run away from us. Um, and now we can have a more participatory relationship with these forces for sure, but you know, they do not belong to the ego and they do not belong to the mental rational. Or as Sri Aurobindo would say, they do not belong to the to the lower mind, right? To the to the um, to the ignorance, as he would describe it, the sort of step by step piecing together the world through reason and logic, and sort of bringing things together in that kind of linear way. Uh, these things are are um, a perceived. They are more mystical, a perceptive, and gnostic. They they emerge through us spontaneously, and they create with us. And so the more we become transparent to those forces, uh, the more integral of a being we can be in the sense that we're no longer just getting pulled along with it, um, uh, but we're passive in the Taoist sense, uh, in, as Gebser would say. Um, this is a question from uh, Vandermeer. And I, I won't read this whole thing, but this is just a quote from Annihilation um, the first book of Vandermeer, where he's describing this starfish, the main character is seeing in a starfish. Um, you know, she, she, she cr climbs down to the beach. She's kind of in a weird state. I think she, she's drunk, uh, had a few drinks and it's where she's studying. She's a biologist, right? So she's been studying starfish and all these uh, different organisms in the Pacific Northwest. Um, and she sees the starfish, but, and she says, I had never seen a story of worlds before, even in an aquarium. And it was so unexpected that I forgot about the slippery rock and shifting my balance almost fell, steadying myself with one arm propped against the edge of the tidal pool. And, but the longer I stared at it, the less comprehensive the creature became. The more it became something alien to me. The more I had a sense that I knew nothing at all about nature, about ecosystems. There was something about my mood and its dark glow that eclipsed sense that made me see this creature, which had indeed been assigned a place in the taxonomy. Again, very magical rational. Um, but she's having an experience that goes beyond that. Catalog, study, described, irreducible down to any of that. And if I kept looking, I knew that ultimately I would have to admit I knew less than nothing about myself as well, whether that was a lie or a truth. When I finally wrenched my gaze from the starfish and stood again, I could not tell where the sky met the sea. Whether I faced the water or the shore, I was completely adrift and dislocated. And all I had to navigate by in that moment was the glowing beacon below me, the starfish. So I thought that was a beautiful expression, a very kind of Petrarch moment in itself, of this coming to consciousness of a new way of experiencing the world, in which you know the mental, rational pinning down of, of objects in space is no longer possible, but objects reveal themselves in their unknowability to us, including ourselves. There's, in the sense that there's an occlusion, there's also a transparency. Objects become infinite and transparent um, in the integral age. So, there's plenty of others. We'll probably go into these in future classes um, that have this sort of evolutionary mysticism at work. And those are listed there. Those are the listed in Dell. Like, we're going to try to put more so than the original for various reasons. I wrote an article on this if you'd like to check that out. Um, and to close, uh, Gebser writes, the present work was written primarily for my generation, or so I thought. But the interest shown by the younger generation has become increasingly evident. The principal subject, subject of the book proceeding from man's altered relationship to time is the new consciousness. And to this, those of the younger generation are keenly attuned. So yeah, and another one, this is how he, one, of, one of the ways he closes the chapters. Behold, it is the eve of time, the hour, when the, the hour when the wanderers turn toward their resting place. One God after another is coming home, therefore be present. So on that note, I think I squeezed everything in to, uh, you know, the hour or two <laughs> we had our presentation. Um, so thank you for, for being present with me. And if you have any questions, uh, let's, let's open it up to chat. And if you do want to hop on microphone and video cam, let me know too, because we can do that as well. Uh, and again, a chat box or Q and A is, is the spot to do it. And thanks Tom or Tommy. 
Uh, one mystical example in the film is Altman's Three Women from 77. It affected Philip K. Dick a lot as he describes in Exegesis. I'm gonna to to check that out, thanks. Um, yeah, heady stuff. Uh, yeah, certainly, uh, there's a lot to think about and it's related to a lot of other thinkers. And, you know, that's the interesting thing about this work and, and these topics in the sense that um, two takeaways probably is that in order to really study consciousness evolution, uh, culture, art, it's related to everything else. And so, you know, there's, there's a necessity of transdisciplinarity and that you, you know, you will exhaust yourself if you try to exhaustively figure out what's going on. Ah, Jody Foster's contact as well. Yeah. That's another good one. Um, interesting way of meeting the other at the end of that film too, the way the alien is portrayed and whether or not it was, it was belief, you know, it was, did it really happen or did it not happen? It transcended a sort of mental rational, right? A sort of scientific understanding and contact. Um, the, the contest itself, it was, it was transcendental and um, beyond measure, beyond instrumental measure. Um, that's a good one as well. And gosh, you know, I really have to reemphasize Mamoru Oshii's uh, Ghosts in the Shell from 1994, not the one that came out last year, which was just, you know, popcorn flick. But uh, that one is, is a theological work of art, and it truly is a work of art, uh, Mamoru Oshii's Ghosts in the Shell. Um, I haven't read the manga comics, but I can certainly recommend the film uh, aesthetically and philosophically and theologically. It's a very Gnostic film. And uh, that explores the non-human turn as well in the sense of uh, the human being becoming more than you. So, you know, like Blade Runner, more human than human is our motto. It's this idea that, you know, uh, the consciousness is becoming more than what human beings are and were. And there's this kind of creative potency that is, is unfulfilled by remaining what it is and wants to become something other, it wants to reach out and touch the logos as it, as it were. Um, so I definitely recommend that as well as sort of a film that explores the theological questions of our time. Um, but yeah, there's a lot here and I wouldn't say I have any real exercises for you except to kind of think about the art that you take for granted today and the music that you listen to and the paintings and, and the digital spaces that you frequent. Uh, there, there's, a, there's a ubiquity and the integral and the aperspectival that you know it's difficult if you're not stopping and thinking about it and reflecting on your phenomenological experience with these things. So um, I think it's very important to do that, especially today, more so than ever before, and not to just kind of become automatic with, uh, especially with all of this technology. If we're going to endorse it, if we're going to say you know, um, you know virtual reality is a sort of the um, uh, the a perspectival cave before we leap into the interval or something we really have to kind of understand the pros and cons of what's going on and how it is a kind of mix of the mental and the interval uh, the time play and sort of the deficient and efficient things that are going on all at the same time um so yeah if, if um if nobody has any other questions i guess we'll wrap up but i will certainly respond to your emails if you have anything following up i know it's a lot to take in and digest um, if the audio was good, feel free to listen to it again. Um, hopefully it was, audio is decent. And, and you know, just kind of work through it, take your notes, and um, maybe questions will arise through that note taking. Uh, maybe not. And uh, get back to me. I'm going to type my email into the chat box here. Some of you already emailed me from last week. And I'm also going to see if I can share the... Donation page, of course, and the Patreon page, of course, where you can, uh, where your patronage is much appreciated. And yeah, of course, David. Um, I think you know if there's interest, we're gonna do more, and I would love to do to bring on other people as well, um, like Devashish Banerjee, um, and. Of course, Richard Doyle, who's going to be talking about uh, Shira Bindo, Tehard, and Philip K. Dick and the New Sphere all together. Uh, Philip K. Dick had a word, he called it ultra metacognition to kind of describe this Gnostic experience of the logos he had. Um, so it's going to be a very kind of fun literary postmodern experience for seven weeks. Um, 
And I would love to do book clubs that really give people the opportunity to look at some of these books. And a few years ago, I did Winter of Origins um, with a friend uh, uh, for metapsychosis, Marco. Some of you may know Marco. Um, and if you see the book, it's it's a book. It's it's a big tome. And we did seven weeks or so, and uh, or maybe longer. It was really a semester long slow process of reading ever present origin and um but it wasn't slow because you know with a book like this you want to read it over a year not you know seven or eight week, weeks so it was intense is what i'm saying and uh i don't know if i'm going to do that this year um i think this class will have to suffice but i think reading the phenomenon of man by tehard or another book by some of these evolutionary mystics might be a good way to kind of come together and give everyone an opportunity to study this stuff uh, with the support of a community. And that's sort of the idea is to kind of get us all together with the support of a community to study, to think a little bit deeper about these topics like the evolution of consciousness, um, to really kind of appreciate the necessity of, of uh, how transdisciplinary they are and how necessary it is to think in a transdisciplinary way for these things and not just kind of like pin things down um, too, too easily or too quickly. And to really think about what it means, you know, is consciousness evolving? What's going on with technology today? What's going on with, you know, all of these things I mentioned with, with digital art and virtual art? Um, is it implicating us? Is this the integral? Um, so it's a big question, you know, because a lot of these writers and a lot of this sort of evolutionary mystical impulse from Sri Aurobindo to Tehard to Henri Bergson, sort of like, um, you know, uh, what's, what's, he, what's his name? Jeffrey Kripal has a book called Esselin, and he's also write, writing about it, Mutants and Mystics. Um, there's an evolutionary mystical literary movement in the 20th century uh, involving Shirobindo and Hari Das Shradhari and Michael Murphy. And, you know, Esselin was coming online the same time that X-Men was being written and created. So there's this, like, sense in the 20th century that it was a... Um, a, a prescience and a, a, a direct sense that the human being was going to transform and that consciousness was going to transform. And to some degree, you know, I think it has happened and to other degrees, it's still happening. And, you know, simply because it's 2017 doesn't mean, you know, oh, okay, where, where is the integral age? Uh, we're living in it. It's a lot more implicated and messy and dynamic and complex. But if you can, embrace an integral methodology that is okay with kind of looking at where integral is expressing itself spontaneously and naturally in culture through art, philosophy, humanities, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you'll feel, I, I think personally, you will feel better about the, where we're headed and hopefully a little bit more optimistic and also a little bit more, no, no longer naive, but hopeful. And, and that's how I, I kind of feel right now. I'm, I no longer feel that, you know, there's this growth to goodness thing going on, but I do feel that there is transformation taking place of self, society, perceptions of nature. That's always happening. So as long as that's always happening, there's always going to be room for us to kind of dig into that. Uh, Peter is saying, I would suggest we use Sarah Appleton Weber's translation of the human phenomenon. Yeah, um, Peter, that is a new translation or semi-new. Um, compared to the old one, uh, that's, a good, that's a good idea. Uh, there's just a more recent translation because this book, uh, I already, you know, you, you saw a quote from it. Um, as interesting as it is, and as beautiful as it is, it's kind of hard to read, and it, it's not an easy read. Um, the translation, and I think even Tehard's um, uh, writing style in, in the original French is probably unique. 1989, wow, that isn't too recent, huh? Um, it only came to my attention a few years ago, so maybe that's why. Um, but okay, everybody, I think that's it. Um, don't want to go on too much. So thanks for participating, and I will see you again for the next class. Uh, check Nura's newsletter in the next couple of days. Over the weekend, we're going to launch uh, the Ultra Metacognition with Richard Doyle. And there's a lot of other classes coming up, like the uh, Southern Reach trilogy, if you want to read it really good eco horror weird ecology uh fiction and think about it with jen and i um that's in february and there's a few others that are coming up as well that i'm excited to announce so thanks for participating and uh i'll see you next time take care everybody have a good night